Master, give the blessing. Wisdom. What you are about to listen to is a podcast produced by Philoclea Ministries. Philoclea Ministries is offered to all free of charge. However, there are real and immediate needs associated with it. If you are a regular listener or enjoy any of the content produced by Philoclea Ministries, we humbly ask that you consider becoming a contributor. You can learn more about our funding needs at www.philocleaministries.org. Please note that Philoclea Ministries is not a 401c3 nonprofit organization and that contributions are not tax deductible. Supporting Philoclea Ministries is just like supporting your other favorite podcasters and content creators, and all proceeds pay the production bills, make it possible for us to pay our content manager, and provide a living stipend for Father David. God bless you, and enjoy the podcast. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. Welcome back, everybody, to our study of the Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climacus. And we are picking up with the final sayings of the step on holy silence and stillness. And we are on page 232, number 77, about midway down the page. And then we'll be moving in to our uh, section on prayer. Bob, did you have a question or did your hand just go? I uh, just made a note about uh, the next book we're doing. Okay. So please, cor- please correct if it's in here. The Ascetical Homilies of St. Isaac the Syrian. That's correct, isn't it? Okay. Very good. Okay. So, number 77 on page 232. Devote the greater part of the night to prayer. And only what is left to the recital of the Psalter. And during the day, again, prepare yourself according to your strength. So we've talked about this many times in the past, uh, about praying at night. And how constant this is as part of the Father's teaching. That uh, breaking the night for prayer, keeping vigil, uh, is a very important part of this spiritual life. That there is a kind of humbling of the mind and the body that takes place at that, that, that time. The world itself becomes quiet around us. And, uh, and so there's this kind of stillness with which one can enter into prayer without distraction. And uh, we've often laughed about St. John Chrysostom saying, well, teach your children this as well, that uh, you wake them up in the middle of the night and have them say a prayer and then put them back to bed. Uh, But then you go ahead and say your your night vigils as well. And so there was, uh, from very early on within the life of the church, there was this sense of uh, that praying at night uh, was very important. We know our Lord himself at times prayed all night long. And uh, and so this lack of distraction, this attentiveness to God and stillness that takes place at that time is very important. And so John says, devote the greater part of the night to, to this quiet uh, prayer of silence uh, and uh, the rest of the time can be used in the reciting of the psalms uh, in order to keep oneself focused and awake uh, but the larger portion is to be given over to stilling the mind and the heart uh, especially through the Jesus prayer until the prayer itself uh, almost begins to to be be silent and the, there's simply a stillness that reigns within us as we stand before God. And uh, again, this isn't uh, the common parlance of Christians these days in in the sense of keeping vigil. And uh, certainly, you know, people have responsibilities in regards to their daily work, family, but there are ways I think in which we, we can take advantage of this. Often people have trouble sleeping or wake up in the middle of the night and they will get online or pick up their phone or uh, turn on the television instead of using that time for prayer. Uh, Certainly uh, those who have children 
infants are awakened multiple times throughout the course of the night. And so as one is tending to one's child, one can be praying to the Lord at those times as well. Uh, and it's not limited, certainly, to, to getting up in the middle of the night. One can get up early and offer the first fruits of the day to God as well uh, before we turn our minds to anything in, uh, in regards to our daily work, that we would turn our minds and our hearts to God, asking him to bless and guide us, that we might do all things in accord with his will. And so part of this is offering all that we have and are to God, and that we begin to see our life as prayer, not again as uh, praying as something that is episodic, but really something that nourishes us uh, and that is akin to our breathing. And, uh, and so to break the night, to break our sleep should not seem all that unusual to us. If we love prayer and we've tasted the sweetness of it over the course of time, there is going to be an urge within us to, to rise during the night to pray, knowing that this is a very special time. Uh, you know, th there is a kind of restraint uh, that one uh, uses in the practice of it, just as the, the monks will talk about when we get back to the Evrikatinos on fasting, that, uh, that one has to be aware of one's limitations. Not everybody fasts in the same way eats the same amount that we have to avoid extremes. And so the same is true with vigils, that uh, this is not something that is taken up lightly, that we do it in a measured way that's in accord with our station in life, and that we might seek to perfect that practice over the course of decades in our life. But nonetheless, that we grow to see it as something important and something that is valuable. Jeff writes, I find that the three o'clock hour is the hour I most regularly awake to spiritual battle, fear, attacks, dreams. There have been many nights I awake during that hour feeling an overwhelming need to pray and sing hymns. I've increasingly seen the value of praying at some time during that hour. Yes, very good. You know, I think to, you know, often we will be awakened by dreams, sometimes dreams that are disturbing. And uh, to turn the mind and the heart to God at that point, to know his peace, is often something also that clears the mind and the heart. Things will rise from the depths of our unconscious uh, during the night and manifest themselves in dreams that are often confusing or disturbing. And so if we awaken from one of those to allow, you know, to turn our minds and our hearts to God, as simple as crying out the name of Jesus uh, in order that we might hand those things over to him and, uh, and be able to find that peace again to go back to sleep. Uh, sometimes late at night or early morning can be a time of demonic provocation when we are sort of semi-conscious. Uh, and so to be vigilant during these times, you know, to be praying, especially before we go to bed and first thing in the morning uh, is important as well. Okay, he'll get back into this as well when we get in, into the step on prayer. But here we, we read it in the context of stillness and the life of, of a hesychist who's embraced the life of silence. And so one who loves prayer or whose life is focused on prayer is going to seek to use every time of the day possible to give themselves enough rest, but nonetheless prefer the nourishment that comes through prayer. And again, remember what the fathers say that, you know, one hour of prayer is like three hours of sleep in terms of its restorative power to the mind and to the body. And uh, there is truth to this. You know, I think we're often weighed down by our anxieties, our, the stresses of day-to-day -day life. And uh, when we enter into the peace of Christ, there's something that relieves us of that burden. And it's pretty well known that when we suffer from depression, often sleep and long hours of sleep is a way of coping with that reality. And, uh, and sometimes entering into this prayer and acting in a counterintuitive way, you know, not uh, to 
uh, avoid the anxiety or the depression so much by going into sleep, but rather turning towards he who is reality, who can offer us this peace and alleviate the burdens that we that so often weigh us down. Okay. Number 78. Reading enlightens the mind considerably and helps it concentrate. For those who, are, I'm sorry, for those are the Holy Spirit's words and they attune those who attend to them. Let what you read lead you to action for you are a doer. Put these words into practice makes further reading superfluous. So when we read the scriptures and when we internalize the words that we read and we understand uh, that these uh, are not uh, uh, static words written on a piece of paper, but the, the living word of God, then uh, it should move us to action. And John puts it in an interesting way here. You're, you're, you're a doer that the, the word that you hear is something that is to drive us to action uh, in the way that we love others and, and our pursuit of, pursuit of virtue or seeking to overcome our sins, uh, that w whenever we hear the word, uh, either in our own reading or at liturgy, that it should be something living for us. And the words that we hear it should be like John the Baptist standing before us, calling us to repent uh, with as much force as he did in the Jordan. Seek to be enlightened by the words of salvation through your labors and not merely from books. So the more we internalize this living word of God, then the written word becomes more and more superfluous for us. You know, whether... Uh, even if it's the scriptures or the writings of the saints, the more that we are open to the guidance of the spirit of truth, uh, the more that we internalize this word, the, the less that we require uh, the, the reading that he speaks of here that enlightens us, that we are enlightened within. He goes on to say, until you receive spiritual power, do not study works of an allegorical nature because they are dark words and they darken the weak. So if you notice the, the footnote there, it, it acknowledges that this is somewhat confusing. But when a, a person early on begins to look for deeper meanings or alternative meanings of the scriptures, uh, rather than, you know, maybe a more literal approach to it, Sometimes they can get wrapped up in their own analysis of, of a text. And so John warns those who are, are young, those who are new to the spiritual life, to simply take the Lord at his word, to look to the fathers as they guide us as well in our study of the scriptures. And those who are uh, not, not only well-versed in the scriptures, but who have lived the life for many years. And uh, so sometimes we can get caught up and, you know, this deeper uh, kind of analysis of the text, looking for multiple meanings. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it can be destructive and, and darken the path for someone who's new to the spiritual life. Number 79. Often one cup of wine is sufficient to reveal its flavor. And one word of the hesychist makes known to those who can taste it his whole inner state and activity. So an interesting thing that one who is a hesychist, one who's entered into that deep silence where God speaks that word that is equal to himself, often then one word from that hesychist, that one who lives in this stillness, uh, is enough not only to nourish those who come to seek his counsel, but reveal something of the depth of the person that they illuminate who it is and the saintliness of the individual before them. Uh, that one word can be filled with far more meaning than perhaps the most eloquent sermon. And so often those who would come to see the Desert Fathers, especially those who lived 
uh, very deep into the desert, one of the things that they would say to them is, Father, speak a word speak a word. And so often it was a very simple thought, uh, much like we would find in the sayings of the Desert Fathers or the writings in the Philokalia, one simple line uh, for them to meditate upon. And that would be sufficient, certainly for the day, but sometimes for far, far, a far longer period of time. We live in an age of many words, and uh, we need to slow ourselves down in order to be more discriminating and discerning of what, what is nourishing and what has value. Number 80. Have the eye of your soul fixed firm against conceit or self-opinion, for nothing is so banefully destructive. So the eye of the soul and again, this is one of the key uh, aspects of the Father's anthropology, the noose, the eye of the heart, the eye of the soul, that when we have been purified of the passions and every impediment of sin has been removed, uh, then we are, are to be ever watchful of that which can again darken that eye, darken our vision. And what does it most of all is conceit and self-opinion, to have a high image of ourselves or our judgment. And uh, today, again, the, people put a lot of store in you know, arguing about the, the faith and debating about it and uh, putting their opinion forward uh, in such a way as to be convincing. And, you know, certainly we are to bear witness to the faith, defend the faith, but I think what we pick up from the fathers is what, what is most important is living it and internalizing the word that we hear and that it becomes important for us to internalize it before we say a single word, uh, knowing that we can easily fall into exactly what he says here, conceit and self-opinion, that it can be con uh, so ever destructive to a person's vision of Christianity, their understanding of the faith of who Christ is, uh, you know, a word said indiscriminately or with anger uh, can really uh, destroy, I think, a, a person's capacity uh, to, be, to approach the faith with a kind of generosity of spirit. Number 81, when you leave your cell, be sparing with your tongue because it can scatter in a moment the fruits of many labors. So similarly, you know, to speak little and to and train ourselves to do that. You know, not necessarily to, to launch forth our opinion uh, every time something is said that is remotely controversial or seems to be critical of the faith. Uh, we do not need to insert ourselves into every discussion because every discussion is not worth uh, our immersing ourselves in uh, that might agitate our own mind and heart or lead us into sin in some way or lead us into anger. And so to be guarded uh, about every single word that we speak becomes very important. Not in a neurotic way, but that we, I think, are cautious that our words really arise from that place of love, of gener generosity, of respect for the other. And if it isn't, then it is better for us to remain silent than the, the risk to sin against love, to sin against charity. God will make up for whatever is lacking, you know, and I think in a person's understanding or what is lacking in our poor words. And so we may only be able to say one simple thing and then allow him to, you know, strengthen what, whatever it is said with grace, so long as it's said with love. And I think we need to be more confident about that. You know, something said, a simple word in love, smile, tender touch, help at the time a person needs it. These are the things that bear the greatest fruit. And to be honest with you, and you know, a very good writer, uh, pretty close to our time, he's died, I think in the, uh, I don't know, early 2000s, Henry Nowen, 
talks about this, you know, the people that have the most, the greatest impact upon us and those of, of whom we have the, the greatest memories are those who, who have assisted us in those times of great need, you know, and perhaps said very little, but we're always there whenever we're suffering or wherever we need a, a helping hand who offer, you know, this tender support and encouragement in the faith or just in life in general. And uh, he's ever so good, I think, in dis discussing tenderness as a virtue. And we aren't very tender with each other anymore. In fact, we're pretty, we can be pretty rough and acerbic, you know. All right. Number 82. Try to be free of curiosity. For can defile stillness as nothing else can. Uh, this often gives rise to objection. Immediately somebody puts up their hand. Well, isn't curiosity a good thing? <laughs> and it is in the sense of it can lead us to explore that which has value. But I think the kind of curiosity that John is talking about and what we would perhaps understand in our own day is how we will flit from one thing to another simply to satisfy this desire we have uh, to be to engage something or to know what's going on or the newest thing and the way i think most people in our day experience it is through the internet you know you connect from one link to another or one, let one video run into another and it can go on for for ages and uh this is the kind of curiosity that john warns about uh, because very quickly it can scatter the mind, fragment the mind, and make us lose our, our focus upon God altogether. Because we get caught up in this curiosity for the next thing. Just, I'll, I'll listen to one more thing. Or, oh, that sounds interesting, this link to this other article. Even if it's about good things, it's still it can wrap us up and draw us along and make us spend time, waste time uh, on things. And I think it's what's seductive about it is that so often it is benign on the surface or that it seems to offer us something that's very good, interesting, or we'll learn something. Uh, but if we're using our time in this way, again, we can become dissipated in the process. And so not be doing what we should be doing, you know, in terms of our daily obedience, our daily tasks, or again, lose, lose sight of God. Anthony writes, this curiosity is a misdirected eros. Yeah, I think so. You know, it can be a love, again, for what is new, a love for information, for information's sake. And I mean, this is what people are constantly talking about. We live in the information age. Isn't it wonderful? We have at our fingertips you know, anything that we want to know. We can even talk to our phone, Siri, what's the weather outside? Or, you know, and so, you know, it, it can dull our it's sense. Oh my God, degrees. my Next phone, rain I'm to... sorry. Uh, my phone actually, when I said Siri, <laughs> my phone actually oh, it picked it up and started to tell me the weather. So you see what I mean? Uh, it's, it's, um, very seductive. And uh, that's funny, Ambrose said it triggered his too, twice. <laughs> and so we do have all of this information at our fingertips, and yet it can be an enormous distraction. And, uh, you know, certainly it can be overtly sinful for people because there's so much out there that is really pretty bad, pretty vile. But I think the greater challenge for those who are religious, too, is that uh, there can be a lot of things that we look for of a religious nature, too, or what people are saying about liturgy or the church or what's the most recent thing the Pope said. I think this is the just as the 24 hour news cycle is one of the worst things in the world for people because it agitates. I think knowing every word that comes out of the mouth of the Pope is not necessarily a good thing. You know, there was an age, you know, the ultramontanists, you know, there was this saying about them that, you know, uh, uh, a 
uh, infallible statement in the daily news from the Pope, you know, would be the, the kind of preference. And, you know, I think people like look for things to pick apart, to, to criticize and to engage in conversation about. And it is incredibly destructive. Uh, you know, monks stay up with the news, but they aren't watching the news daily. You know, they might, uh, uh, you know, have a, a newspaper or something like that, or they might hear something a couple of weeks after it happened. Uh, we, we have this sense that we need to know everything that uh, as it's unfolding. I was reading a, a little thing today that said how absurd it is that uh, we would watch something like a, a news trial. Uh, and I think the person used the example of the O.J. Simpson trial. So it was an older book, but, uh, you know, what nonsense that is to be immersed out of curiosity into the playing out of a trial and every person as he's, you know, going through examination and, you know, how, what, what would that, what does that do to the mind? And I think it does, I think it dulls our sensibilities and we lose sight, we lose this capacity to have real wonder over what deserves wonder. We can no longer see the, the, the grace and the presence of God in that which is around us or others because we're so glued to things that we are seeing online or on television. And, you know, what, what is more beautiful? I mean, we've moved into this new, new house and it's been cure an interesting thing because all of a sudden you see all these animals all over the place. You know, you walk, wake up in the morning and there's, you know, a, a bunch of rabbits running around the yard and multiple doves. And, you know, it's uh, a be beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, when you're in the, in the city, you can lose sight of that. And, uh, but again, you can, you also lose that sensibility of, of wonder that Isaac will talk about so much. You know, being able to see the presence and the glory of God and what he's created and especially what he's given us. And when we allow curiosity to draw us down that path and it lead us to become enamored with, again, with information, uh, we fill the mind and the heart that I think blocks out our vision of that which is greater. You know, it's like eating junk food all the time. And you, I think you lose your taste for or that which is really nourishing. Okay. So, 83. Goodness sake, hold on for a second. I'm having a rough night with technology. I leaned, leaned on my car keys and I set off my car alarm. Okay. <laughs> oh boy. Maybe we could have ran up edit some of these out. <laughs> All right, 83. Offer to those who visit you what is necessary both for the body and for the spirit. If they are wiser than we are, let us show our philosophy by silence. And if they are brethren following the same way of life, let us open the door of speech to them in due measure. Yet it is better to regard all as superior to us. So uh, we want to be measured again in how much we speak and what kind of conversation that we enter into. And so if someone is wiser than us, then it is better for us to remain silent. We show our philosophy, our vision of life, our, our true wisdom by our capacity to listen, to be docile, to be teachable, by someone who has greater experience than, than us. And if it is someone who shares our what, the vision of life, our way of life, our desire for Christ, then we have a greater freedom to speak with them. But even here, uh, John says, we do that with a kind of measure, in a, in a measured way, that uh, to, you know, to have ta to talk about the things of the kingdom for four hours straight uh, is not necessarily the 
the the best thing you know what, what is one hearing or what is one focused on or do we get sort of an enamored of hearing our own voice or enraptured more with what the other is saying uh again when we are talking about the things of god what is needed is this capacity again to listen to be silent and uh and sometimes in our speech we muddy the waters you know some of the greatest homilies i've heard are also the shortest homilies and uh in fact uh fulton sheen said it's much harder to give like a two-minute sermon or three-minute sermon than to talk for an hour about something some aspect of the faith because it requires really that one has internalized it and can distill it in such a way that it comes forward uh, and is able to to reach to the depths of a, another person's religiosity and take root there. And uh, and so sometimes, you know, our unmeasured talking about something is more a reflection of our lack of having internalized it or really understanding what it is that we are talking about. And yet he says, it is better to regard all as superior to us. So to have a kind of docility, teachability, that we tend to listen more to what the other is saying. And I think that's good counsel across the board, you know, that we are often thinking about what we are going to say while the other person is talking, rather than suspending judgment and listening, listening wholeheartedly to what the other person is saying, whatever it is, in order to be able to understand what they are experiencing. And uh, again, I think this is what we have to regain. And to suspend judgment can be the most difficult thing for us to do. The moment somebody says a certain word, it can trigger something in us, oh, that person is a liberal nut, you know, and we're thinking about what we're going to, to say in response to them. And uh, again, it's conceited and it lacks a kind of charity towards, towards the other. And it lacks certainly this docility that we, we, there's something that this person perhaps has to say that God has led them to us to say. And we don't want to miss that moment because we're focused more on ourselves. Number 84. Let me see. I want to forbid those who are still children all bodily work at the time of vigil. But he who carried sand all night in his cloak restrained me. So John is saying here that there was part of him that wants to tell people, you know, when you're given over to this silent prayer and praying at night, don't take up labors, whether it's spiritual reading or physical work. And yet he's reminded, he says, and if you look at the footnote, he's speaking specifically of St. Pacomius, who carried sand around at night. And so again, engaged his body in such a way as to maintain his focus that john understands that you know sometimes our physical fatigue or our struggle for attentiveness requires that we do something and so using a chalk key or a rosary to hold on to or to stand while at prayer or sometimes to pray the psalms you know all these things can be important to keep ourselves attentive and so not everybody's going to be able to simply sit in that silence for, hour, for hours without falling asleep. And certainly Pacomius was, you know, one of the great ascetics. And so if he had to do this, then certainly we, we're going to have to. Uh, I missed a, a couple comments here. Kathy, uh, how can you break its whole internet accessory, et cetera? Well, I, th I think it is by uh, engaging in some of these practices and allowing oneself to taste the sweetness of it. 
you know, to, to taste the sweetness of silence. So to take regular retreats, and I think, you know, weekly is what I'm talking about, even if it's a few hours where we break away from everything and go to a chapel or go to a prayer corner and do spiritual reading and, you know, stay away from the computer. Uh, at the monastery, they have two hermit days uh, where, you know, that they're uh, during Lent in particular, uh, where they gather for matins and liturgy in the morning, but the rest of the day is in silence. And they, you know, you get your bread on your own. And it's a fast days typically too. And so you have a piece of bread or something or fruit, but the whole day is in silence. And, uh, and they do that regularly. I, I don't think twice a week. Uh, uh, I think it's once a week, uh, I have a hermit day. And I think for ourselves, we can imitate that, embrace that model, even if it can't be a full day uh, because of the realities of our life. Uh, it could be a few hours where we turn off the computer, we uh, go to a silent place where we aren't going to be interrupted by others. And so to foster this love of silence and in, in order that we can sort of taste the sweetness of that time with, with Christ and then it, the hold of the internet and the hold of other things uh, that in, engage us on so many different levels begins to weaken. Uh, we overcome our love for the internet or curiosity by a greater love, our love for Christ. So if we just tell ourselves, I'm not going to use the internet, I'm just gonna cut this off, or I'm gonna get off Facebook. I've heard, I've said that a thousand times and other people have said that a thousand times to me. But uh, what leads us to the moderation of our use is the, the, the greater love for our desire to connect with Christ, to pray. And the more that we enter into that, and John will go into this about not only the quality of the time, but the quantity of time in prayer is important. And so to stretch ourselves in the time that we spend in prayer, uh, the place uh, used to be, we, I, I've mentioned, we had a th uh, first Friday vigil. So the first Friday of the month, we would have a three hour vigil uh, and uh, by the third hour, physically and uh, internally, you're humble because the third hour prayer, you're fatigued, but also by that time, all the thoughts that you were struggling with during that first hour, the scatteredness from the busyness of your day, you spend that whole first hour struggling with those. The second hour, uh, things begin to settle down a little bit, but that third hour, things become very still. And so if we can make these mini retreats uh, that uh, they can help break us loose from that which has a hold, hold on us. And then we see more and more time opening up for us that God reveals to us to, to, and for that opportunity for prayer and to spend time with him in silence. We often aren't aware of it because we are misusing it or we're letting it pass us by. All right, number 85. What is said in the dogma of the holy, uncreated and adorable Trinity contrasts with the doctrine of the providential incarnation of the one person of this all him Trinity. For what is plural in the Trinity is single in him and what there is single, the here is plural. And in the same way, some undertakings are suitable for those in stillness and others for those in obedience. So the incarnation itself, the revelation of the Trinity, but also the, the, re the revelation of, of Christ himself, who takes our flesh upon himself, becomes obedient to the Father, uh, manifests the love of the kingdom in how he lives his life before us. 
uh, this reality, this revelation reveals to us that there are some that are called to, in this life, enter into that reality of the, the Trinity, enter into the life of that uh, uh, fullness of love uh, and eternal love through entering into the silence. Some are called to that and bear witness to that. Others bear witness to what is revealed to us in Christ by the imitation of his unconditional love and his obedience even unto death. And so John is using what is what, what is at the really heart of our faith and what has been revealed to us to say, some are called to bear witness to this greater reality in the stillness and the silence of their life. Some bear witness to the love that is revealed to us in Christ through their living the common life, living in obedience, setting aside their will for the sake of love. Number 86, the divine apostle says, who has known the mind of the Lord? And I will say, who has known the mind of a man who is a hesychist in body and spirit? So isn't that interesting? You know, who knows the mind of one who's embraced this life wherein all has been stilled and is nourished in that silence upon the love of God and seeks nothing else but that reality. Uh, you know, that this is akin to entering into the mind of God, that because that person is living so fully in that reality, living the angelic life, if you will, so, so wrapped in the, the worship and the love of God that uh, it's very difficult for us to understand what might be going on internally for that person. We see aspects of it in their countenance and, and we see, see it even in their silence. But until we have entered into it ourselves, we will not know it. There's nothing that can be said about it uh, that will teach us it has to be experienced. And John will say the same thing about prayer itself. Even by after writing a whole step on prayer at the very end of it, he says, none of this you can look, learn from books. The way that you learn what prayer is, is from praying. And so you learn the sweetness of stillness by allowing yourself to enter into it. Number 87. The power of a king consists in his wealth and the number of his subjects. The power of a hesychist in abundance and riches of richness of prayer. So we see, you know, we see what he loves, where his treasure is found, and it's found in prayer. Where your treasure is. Uh, let me, let me I, uh, my mind's not working. What's the full phrase here? Somebody help me out. Uh, there is your heart, right? Or where your heart is, there is your treasure. Uh, I, have back, I think I have it backwards tonight. Sorry about that, folks. But you get the idea that we reveal what we treasure or what is dear to our heart uh, by where we direct our attention. Where your treasure is, there will, will be your heart also. Thank you, Rebecca right on the money, uh, right. And so a person who treasures stillness, and tre but treasures God and treasures that love above all is going to want to pray constantly. It's not going to be a law or a discipline. It's going to be desire that takes them there. Okay. Any final comments about step number 27 before we move on to the step on prayer? Okay. Step 28, on holy and blessed prayer, the mother of virtues, and on the attitude of mind and body in prayer. So again, John, is in all the steps, begins with a little definition, but not so little, 
I mean, it's, it's quite full of meaning here. So this will be a section again that we want to go back over and over again. Prayer by reason of its nature is the converse and union of man with God. And by reason of its action upholds the world and brings about reconciliation with God. Isn't that extraordinary? That John is saying, you know, there's nothing here about discipline or, uh, but rather about union, converse. But the most striking thing is that by this action, John is telling us that the world is upheld. That this union with the Lord, this deep love of the Lord that draws the, the mind and the heart of the Christian is something that holds the world and keeps it from falling into destruction and darkness. It's almost reminiscent of, you know, that question, if there's about 10, you know, good or holy men in the city, you know, will you preserve it? And so it, as long as there are prayers you know, the church, the world itself is, is upheld. And there's this possibility for reconciliation with God. And it's a humbling thing to think about because we are often, you know, in this mode of fixing or building, achieving, even on a religious level. And to think that what the world often sees as a waste of time is something that holds the world together and opens the door to reconciliation with God, that hearts that are fully given over to him in this way, you know, become this conduit of grace for everyone around them. And I think that's why, you know, St. Seraphim of Seraph says, you know, the one who knows the peace of Christ, you know, will save thousands. And again, it's a curious statement because it's, it's not saying, you know, one who builds the biggest churches or has the most programs or raises the most money. It's the one who knows the peace of Christ will save thousands, you know, that uh, because this opens them up to this kind of wonder that turns them to the love that has been revealed to us in Christ. It is the mother and also the daughter of tears. So it gives birth to, to tears. So we see with a, a great clarity when we're immersed in prayer, the depth of God's love and how often we do not reciprocate that love, how often we do not return it. And so out of that is born tears, uh, but also the, the daughter of tears that uh, you know that it goes along with our praying that it give it prayer gives birth to it uh, but uh, the tears then produce greater prayer as well the propitiation of sins so our prayer, our open, you know, our turning toward God is, is something that is cleansing of the heart. You know, if it opens us up to experience the grace and the mercy of God, this is going to be the most powerful thing for us. And this is, again, why we should love liturgy, you know, that we are engaged in this prayer and this privileged kind of prayer where we are Christ gives himself to us, body, blood, and soul, and divinity. So our prayer and preparation for that, our prayer after that, and during it, should be the, uh, the most important thing for us in this world, that we should live from Eucharist to Eucharist. And uh, in, it, in, in, in and through it, we are cleansed. A bridge over temptations. So the moment that we see any kind of provocation, whether it's arising out of our own mind and imagination, memory, or if it's being put set before us, that the moment that we turn to prayer, it is overcome, it's stilled. Uh, there are two of the fathers, Barsanufius and John, uh, in their conversation, they talk about it, prayer making it, uh, these temptations dissipate like smoke. 
and uh, and so whether it's a bridge or uh, what they, they call it, immediately it disperses the provocation, the thoughts that go along with temptation. A wall against afflictions. And so not in the sense that we don't experience affliction, uh, but that it, it prevents us from being overcome by them. And if it does prevent afflictions, it prevents the afflictions that we often will bring upon ourselves. That we come under God's protection. And so the more we pray, then we aren't negligent uh, of our thoughts or what we expose ourselves to. So it helps us endure afflictions, but also avoid the ones that we, the crosses that we build for ourselves. The crushing of conflicts. Again, this is a profound thing because, you know, union between Christians, and I've often thought this, it's not because we're going to come to some agreement theologically uh, between East and West. You know, again, there's constant conversation, new books coming out about this all the time. I don't think it's going to come about through that. I think it's, it comes about again through uh, uh, saints and through those who are taking up their crosses and those who are engaged in constant prayer. It's the crushing of conflicts. So whether it's personally between ourselves and other individuals, you know, our first response to conflict should be prayer. So again, this means suspending judgment, remaining silent, and turning to the Lord first in order to be the healer of conflict. I don't know if I've ever heard any, I've heard only maybe a handful, you know, of priests and hierarchs talk about you know, seeking union through the ascetic life, through prayer and through fasting, you know, and not just saying it in an offhanded way, but with constancy, saying this is how we are to live our life, that we overcome self-will, we overcome that pride that divides us only by giving ourselves over to, to Christ and the union and communion that he alone can create. a work of angels. So in prayer, we are imitating those who are, are constantly before the throne of God and interceding on our behalf. We hear Christ himself tell this, you know, tell, uh, tell us this when he speaks about not leading the innocent ones into sin. Because I tell you, their angels are constantly before the throne of God. So, you know, they have this in immediate intercession on their behalf. And uh, so, you know, we are to be engaged in, in this kind of work of the angels, this angelic work, constantly interceding, not, not, and not only praying for ourselves, but for others. The food of all the bodily, bodiless spirits. So we are nourished, we seek our nourishment in, this, in the same way that, again, the angels seek it and the saints seek it. That first and foremost, we crave, we hunger for the Lord who offers himself to us as the bread of life. Future gladness. So it's a reflection of our hope in the promises of Christ. So when we, we pray, we are not praying for, you know, immediate resolution of what it is that we are suffering. We're praying with this confidence that all things will work for the good of those who love the Lord. And that he will, he will bring us where we need to be. Unending activity. So again, you know, people often look at prayer life and, uh, and the internal life, our struggle with the passions as being a waste of time. Whereas uh, John describes it here as this kind of unending activity, but it's within the heart. We're constantly engaged 
in our re relationship with the Lord and engaged in that again, which uh, serves not only for the building up of our own lives in Christ, but for others as well, a source of virtue. So, you know, all of our virtues don't come simply through hard work or discipline, but by the grace of God. And so if we want to grow in a particular virtue or overcome a vice, we pray and we pray constantly. A means of obtaining graces. Again, you know, this is the door, the window for us uh, through which we are able to receive what God desires to give us. Uh, but if we ignore him and uh, we turn to other things, uh, we shouldn't be surprised then if we find ourselves struggling. Invisible progress. So often what, what is taking place within us, we do not see. And I've mentioned here a couple of times uh, the notion that what we see of the saints is the least of them. So the holiness that we see, uh, the virtue that we see, the, even the miracles that they might perform is the least of part of them. That what God does in them by his grace and through, through prayer is more than we can begin to imagine. The action of the Holy Spirit within the heart of an individual. And it's not only something that we aren't aware of, but they aren't aware of either. You know, that there's part of the God that protects us from uh, any pride in revealing to us you know, all that is going on within or our particular state in the spiritual life. It is food for the soul. So again, nourishment for us, enlightenment of the mind. So, you know, again, this, our intellect, our reason is something that is limited. And no matter how profound our understanding of church teaching might be, or the writings of the fathers, it's never going to be what God reveals to us by his grace. And that is man made manifest through uh, the gift of faith, where we comprehend that which is beyond reason, where we begin to uh, experience and see God as he is in himself. This is what prayer opens the door for, for us in faith to comprehend God and his love as it is in its fullness. So again, it could be this dark, obscure knowing, but it's far greater than anything that, again, we could read in a book or that we can think about with our own mind and articulate. It doesn't mean that those things don't matter, but they can only take us so far within the spiritual life. And the more that we progress, the more we see how, how uh, small of a distance it can take us in comparison to something like prayer. And acts against despair. Uh, and so, again, you know, we are often going to struggle with despondency, but we're also going to struggle uh, simply on an emotional level. Living in the world, in a fallen world, where we know our own weaknesses, we also know the weaknesses of others, the cruelty of others, the cruelty of life, the sufferings that we bear physically and emotionally, we can uh, be you know, confronted with uh, this temp great temptation to despair, to wonder, where are you, God? And I think prayer allows us to see that he's right there in the midst of it, that he's taken it all upon himself, that we aren't in isolation, we aren't alone. And I think what leads us into despair so often is this experience of being alone, of being isolated, or feeling unloved. And a person who's immersed in prayer is going to have this powerful weapon against prayer and you know to describe it as an axe is a pretty powerful term it's you know something that can cut out you know what often takes hold of us in such a powerful way a demonstration of hope 
So even in the face of the darkness of the world, I have people every day say to me, I think our, our world is falling apart. You know, the, you know it's, we're on the edge of disaster. And a person who prays is this, you know, gives this demonstration of hope that our destiny is in the hands of God. Our life is in the hands of God. And so however dark the world might become around us, or, you know, no matter how disordered it might seem to us, you know, what we find in Christ is this, this hope that what endures to everlasting life is not that. And to focus upon that is, is mistaken for is a mistake for us. The prayer allows us to be focused upon what gives us real hope. That what endures is not all the, the, that is ugly and dark and wicked, but that which is good. A cure for sorrow. And it's a hard thing. I think sorrow by its very nature makes us turn in on ourselves. And, you know, and people's sorrow is real. You know, oftentimes it is great loss that people have experienced, pain from the past, you know, of deep wounds. And there's something about prayer though that allows even the healing of memory and imagination, you know, of all the things that we feel have indeed shaped our experience of ourselves and our experience of life that have set our path. And we can even feel that it really has limited us in terms of our capacity to love and give ourselves in love or work or be happy to be free and yet to pray uh, as John tells us here is, is a cure for this. You know, again, it's not to allow those things, those realities, those things that have really happened to our life to be what defines our, our identity. What defines who we are is the love revealed to us in Christ, that we are sons and daughters of God. So no matter how we've been treated or what our life has been, uh, even in our own estimation, that we, again, have been made heirs of the kingdom, that we have access to the treasure house of God's grace and of his everlasting love. And the more we pray, the more we see that with greater clarity. The wealth of monks, and we'll stop with this one since it's 830. So, you know, th often the monks are seen as the poorest of individuals, you know, often having nothing, living in hut or cave. And so they are truly poor in the eyes of this world, you know, and might not be known by anyone. You know, uh, uh, St. Paul the, the hermit, you know, the, the first hermit, you know, he really was driven into the desert because of a threat to his life, but ends up staying there in the desert and embracing this ascetic life. And it's only at the end of his life that Anthony goes out, St. Anthony goes out searching for him and finds him only a, a small while before he dies. So he lives in this obscurity all of his life and yet is the, you know, one of the most wealthy of individuals in terms of the life of grace and life of prayer. And even Anthony the Great sees and understands this, that there is one in the desert who has, you know, lived this life in a greater measure than you have. And so John is preparing us, you know, so beautifully here, even in these first, in this first paragraph for what he's going to unfold about prayer here as we go along. Anthony writes, if chronological time is a creature, prayer brings us to Kairos time, which is like the Shekinah or Tabor light is, is uncreated. Thus, things in chronological past can be healed. That's beautifully said. So that we, we are drawn into the glory of God. And we are drawn beyond the chronological time as we experience it as well as the wounds 
that we experience and that are afflicted on us in the midst of it. And so we experience even now the eternal life in Christ and prayer draws us into that. That's why it can be a cure for the deepest of sorrows. So again, isn't it, it's, it does fill one with wonder because all of a sudden you think the prayer is not a discipline. You know, on some level, I should not have to force myself. I know that I need to because of the weakness of my will, but there is something so beautiful that's held out to us here, an experience of union and communion with God, that if we can take hold of the wonder, the desire that it elicits within us, if we can taste something of the sweetness of it, then it's going to transform our lives and the lives of those around us. And it will bring about, I think, a magnificent simplicity. You know, if we let go of the worries, the anxieties, the fears, the darkness, then, and we live in the joy of Christ, then we begin to let go of the things that just weigh us down, material goods, as well as the weight of our past and of memories, you know, when we, our minds are filled with Christ. So this is going to be a beautiful step and uh, one paragraph, half of a paragraph has been magnificent. So I look forward to picking up with, with you next week. So when we close as always, we go our Father, in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thank you all.